my talk is about writing a hypervisor with Rust. And so a little about me, and I'm currently studying computer science at the JQU. And I've been using Rust since like 2020, and I really fell into love with it. And I'm also really interested in reverse engineering and game hacking. And that's how this project got started. So let's take a look what exactly a hypervisor is. And Wikipedia defines it as a software that runs virtual machines. And the, there's actually a distinction between two types. A type one that runs directly on the hardware, which means it's a lot more effort to implement because you need to do everything on your own. And then there's also a type two hypervisor, which runs on the operating system. So there you don't have to do everything on your own. You can use the operating system to allocate virtual memory or physical memory. And it's a lot easier, but still a little complicated. So where are hypervisors used? What can you use them for? And one of the most common use cases is just virtual machines to run another operating system on your already running operating system. And examples for this are VMware, VirtualBox, KVM. I'm sure all of you have used it before. Another really powerful example is serverless computing. So for example, running functions, so functions as a service on a server. And one really popular example is Amazon Firecracker, which uses Rust and is built on top of KVM. This is a Linux kernel module and handles all the hypervisor stuff. And for example, they don't have virtual machines. They call them micro VMs. And with that, so with that, they can restrict the resources they have access to. So for example, you can say, this function should only access 120 megabytes of memory, or should only use up to two virtual CPUs. And this is really powerful because you don't just want some random guy that uploaded a function to access the entire memory or entire system. So it's really good that there's some uh, security built in. And that's exactly what hypervisors are used for. So another example is antivirus. So a with a hypervisor, so it's a hardware feature supported by the CPU. And because of that, you have a lot more control over the system. And the antivirus can effectively use it to find if a program is doing something weird, but also they can protect against it. They can protect some resources, some memory, or yeah, do some other stuff. And one example for an antivirus is the Windows virtualization-based security. And there they have code integrity checks, also protection against direct memory attacks. And it's very hard to circumvent because they are using a hypervisor. And another really cool example is fuzzing. So in fuzzing, the goal is to find uh, states of the program that make, make it crash. And there you need to trace over all the instructions and also pause at certain instructions. And with a hypervisor, you can do that. And on top of that, you can even pause at a certain point and resume at another point. This is really powerful. And I really recommend checking out uh, Gemoto Labs uh, GitHub repository. He has a ton of really interesting projects, also written in Rust. And then there's also the bad side. You can also use it for malware or cheats. Just like the antivirus can use it uh, to have more power for the good, bad people can use it to gain more power and to hide from the antivirus or anti-cheat. Because everything has to rely on something. Usually it's about the operating system, but they also have to rely on the hardware. So how would they know that they're running inside a virtual machine? There's some ways, some timing attacks. I'll come back to that later, but you can still do it and make it seem like they're running on a real system when they're not. So why would you write your own hypervisor? And for me, it's a lot about just the challenge. And 
it's a really challenging and also rewarding project. And I also wanted to learn more about the details about CPUs and like how everything works. And since I'm coming from a game hacking and security background, I was also interested in figuring out if I could actually bypass the anti cheat. And yeah. So, what exactly can you do with a hypervisor? And the answer is pretty much everything. You have control over the entire system. You can intercept instructions or memory accesses. So you can do whatever you want. So let's take a look at some parts that are involved when you're writing a hypervisor. So one of the most powerful parts is a nested page table. Or in this, this case, it's just a regular page table. You have a virtual address. And it goes through all the page tables, and at the end, you have the physical address. And with a hypervisor, you can have two of those. And that's called a nested page table on AMD. So if you're inside a virtual machine, you think you have, let's say, four gigabytes of memory. And this virtual memory is resolved to physical memory. But because the virtual machine thinks it only has four gigabytes, but in fact, on the actual host, this four gigabytes is resolved again to the real machine memory. And there you can do some really interesting things like that only setting certain pages to read. So no write access. And that's also what virtualization-based security does. It's really powerful. Another part of a hypervisor is an MSR bitmap. So MSR stands for Model Specific Register. And they basically allow you to read certain data from the CPU or change the behavior. And with this bitmap, you can essentially intercept those requests. So you can read an MSR, also write to one. And with a hypervisor, you can intercept those. And when intercepted, a virtual machine exit, a short VM exit, will occur. And you can imagine it somewhat like an interrupt, which just calls a callback in the hypervisor. Then the VM exit will be handled and returns to the original location where it occurs. And another part of a hypervisor is the virtual machine control plug. And it basically consists of two things the safe area and the control area. And the safe area contains all the information about a virtual machine. So the registers, the segments, and also some debug fields. So if you pause the virtual machine, all the informa information is written to this struct. So you can pause it, do some other stuff, and come back later and resume it at this point. And the other part is the control area where you can, as the name says, control certain behavior. So you can specify what you want to intercept. For example, the RDTSC instruction, which reads the timestamp counter, also the CPU ID, uh, also reads or write to the CR, the control registers, and a ton of other instructions. You can also enable the nested paging. Uh, which we saw before with the nested page table, also set the next instruction pointer and other things. And because modern CPUs have multiple cores, you need to create this struct, the vCPU data for each core. And each core has a guest VMCB, virtual machine control plug, and a host VMCB. And then also, we have a pointer to the shared data. So we don't want an MSR bitmap on nested page table for each core. We could, but there's not really a use case for that. So we just have a shared data for that. So let's take a look at the implementation. And for that, I'm going to take a look at how you can virtualize a single CPU. So let's switch to the code. OK, so I have a hypervisor struct. And it basically just consists of all the CPU cores you have. And this is the vCPU struct. And when you call the virtualized method, we just iterate over all the processors you have. 
And then we use the Windows API to switch the execution to a specific processor because we really have to make sure that we're not virtualizing the same CPU core, I just call it processor, twice. That's going to fail horribly. And we just call the virtualize method on the processor struct, on the vCPU struct. So let's take a look at it, what it does there. So we pass the shared data, and then we create the context. And this context is really important that it's at this place. I'll come back to that later. The context just has all the registers and all the instruction pointer. And then we make a check if this CPU core has already been virtualized. Because as I said, we don't want to virtualize it twice. And you can do that with an atomic. And yeah, it's not really important. If it, has not been, if it has not been virtualized, we virtualize it. So we set the flag. We do some initialization. And then we create the vCPU data. We also create uh, our own stack. And we launch the VM with some manual assembly. I'm not going to go for it. That's way out of scope and then we launch it and the important thing is we created the context and when we launch the vm it will resume execution at this context so we launch it and then we're suddenly back here then we check again is this cpu core already virtualized we already set the flag so it is so now we are not virtualizing it again we just return true. And that's done for every CPU core. And yeah, in the launch script, we just uh, use the VM run. And that's running until we get a VM exit. So that's how you virtualize a single CPU or multiple. It's effectively the same for multiple, multiple cores. So I mentioned the term VM exit. And it's one of the most important things you need when interacting with the guest. So we have a VM exit handler, which is called from our custom assembly. You can find it here. And that's not important. The important thing is we get the vCPU data and the guest registers. So the VM exit is again called for a specific core. And there we need to, need to do some initialization. That's not important. And then we can, with the vCPU data, we can access the guest virtual mas machine control clock, VMCB. And then the control area, there's the exit code. So if we got a VM exit and our callback has been called, we want to know which VM exit it was. So for example, did someone try to read the timestamp counter? Or did a nested page fault occur? Or did somebody try to execute the CPU ID instruction? Or did someone try to read an MSR or write to one? So there's a ton of options. And I basically programmed it that you can specify your own handler. And I can take a look, yeah. So one example for a handler, I mentioned it before, you can do a timing attack to detect if your code is running inside a virtual machine or running under a hypervisor. And one of those ways is to execute the RDTSC instruction. So we disabled interrupts because we want to make sure it's not, uh, yeah, it's correct. And then we execute it a thousand times or a little more. And we execute the RDTSC instruction. And remember, now a VM exit ha happens. So we jump to the VM exit handler. The VM exit handler executes some code, and then it jumps back. And this is the first pick. So RDTC re returns the CPU in, uh, cycles. And every time the CPU does some work, it's uh, incremented. So when we do the second RDTC, we, re we read the cycles again we take the difference. We're going to notice a difference because we have been executing the VM exit handler code. And on a normal system, 
it's pretty much always between 25 and 500 cycles. So this is just a heuristic, but in 99.999% of cases, it's always this. So how could we get around that? And I already showed you, we can, let me switch back. We can check if there's a VM exit for an RDTSC. So let me show you an implementation that gets around that. So this is the handle RDTSC and it's called whenever, so it's called here. And there we, first of all, we get the real timestamp. And we also save the previous timestamp and we take a difference. And so if we, so the first one is just zero, but then we save it. And then for the second one, we compare the difference to the first RDTSC. And if it's below a certain threshold, uh, we then check what was the previous VM exit. So if the previous VM exit was also for an RDTSC instruction, we can just return a random number that's between 25 and 35, how long it usually takes, and then just add that to our fake RDTSC. And then we just set the correct registers and we can return. And the important thing is with the RDTSC threshold, what if someone adds a sleep for 1,000 milliseconds, so one second in between there, and we just increment by 20 or 35, something in between. Then it would seem like there was no sleep. So that's the important thing about the threshold. And you can do the same thing or a similar thing for CPU ID. So you can check if there's a VM exit for CPU ID. And then you can basically just execute it normally. And for example, there's a flag that detects if a hypervisor is present and it's set automatically by the CPU. But a program can just check that if, if it's running under a hypervisor. And what we can do, we can execute the normal, the real CPU ID, and then just toggle the flag, just remove it, and then return it again. And the guest will not know that this was ever set. And yeah. Here the same, we can just return zero. And the same for a model specific register. We can also again just get the vCPU and the registers and modify the registers there. So it's really powerful and you can do a lot of things with it. So let's take a look at some other things that I think are really cool about this project. So for some structures, you need to allocate contiguous. So memory that's in one uh, area, not split into multiple chunks, contiguous physical memory. And the example for that is the MSR bitmap. But most of the times you only need virtual memory. So if you have a global allocator, you need to find a way to now allocate contiguous physical memory. You could do it on your own, but I found a really neat solution. We can just, create a new struct, which is called physical allocator. And then we can implement the allocator trait for that. And if you want to take a look at the implementation, you can check out my repository. I'll publish it uh, after this talk. And we have, just have to implement the allocate and deallocate function. And once we did that, we can just use the new in functions of all the structs in the alloc trait. And we can specify the allocator. So now our instance is actually allocated on with physical memory instead of virtual memory. And you can even patch errors because often if the system is out of memory, you don't want to just crash and stop. You want to handle the memory and free some memory or do some other tricky stuff. So you can actually handle it, which is really cool. And with a virtual memory allocator, uh, this is just a recap, but I think it's also important to mention. I created a crate, which is called kernel alloc, and you just need those three lines and you have a virtual memory allocator. 
So you don't need to go through the new endlands creating your own allocator. You can ju just use this create, which is also really cool in my opinion. So another thing I found really useful was bit fields. So for example, in this case, we want certain fields of this struct uh, called event injections to be a certain size. So the vector field should only be go from bit zero to bit seven, then the type from eight to 10 and the error code valid should only be bit 11. And with this bit field create, we can essentially do that and it will automatically generate those functions, which is really useful. No more and and or bit magic trickery. And another thing are bit flags. So this is really important because the AMD manual says how they have to be defined. And I didn't want to just create tons of uh, constants that define those. You can actually, with this create, define them as a struct, which is also really cool. So in this case, the en enable LBR is the server of bit, and the virtualize VM save is the first bit set, and, and so on. And one thing that really annoyed me, I had a ton of errors just because of misaligned structs or because they had the wrong size because I used the wrong data type. And unfortunately, Rust doesn't have compile time assertions. But I found a really useful create called static assertions. And with that, you can just use the const assert equals macro, then specify the size of and the type, and then the size of the struct. It really saved me a ton of time. So how can you actually use my hypervisor? And I think I already went over that, yeah. So I already took that away. So this was the example with the RDTSC and yeah, implementing the handlers. Yeah. So of course I encountered some problems because it's just yeah, it's really low level and there's not as lot as much information available about it. So it's inevitable. So one issue was alignment. So the MD manual is really strict. And for example, the nested page table has to be four kilobyte aligned. And if you don't follow that rule, bad things will happen. And yeah, it's just gonna, it's not even gonna crash. It's gonna do weird things and you have a really hard time to figure out what went wrong. And the solution for that is to just use assertions with the static assertions create I mentioned, and also found this Elaine create, which uh, made it easier to make sure the structs are aligned. Another thing is, yeah, the invalid struct sizes. And yeah, it's very easy to get the wrong data type, especially if you copy C++ code because there's these weird data types and yeah. And unfortunately, there's also no automatic generator for all the structs from the MD manual. There's one for C++ that just passes the Intel manual and then updates all the offsets and fields. I would have wished something similar existed for Rust with MD, but unfortunately, it doesn't. And I tried to do it, implement it on my own, but passing PDF is really no fun. I can't recommend it. But yeah, the manual solution for that, again, is assertions. And also had one really, really weird bug. And it, so I didn't use the allocator I showed you before. I used my own struct. And it's called allocated memory. And it had two functions, alloc normal, so normal virtual memory, and alloc contiguous, which allocates uh, physical memory. And the weird thing is, if we have a struct foo and we embed another instance of this allocated memory inside foo and it goes out of scope, it just leaks memory. And it's really weird. I wrote a blog post about it, uh, have a read. And if you know why it's happening, feel free to message me. Uh, yeah, I solved it by just using the allocator and uh, coming back to the box and vec. Because as it turns out, box doesn't have a drop function. So if you take a look at the drop function of box, 
it just says it's implemented by the compiler. And I figured there has to be a reason why it's com implemented in the compiler, not in the Rust code. So I just stuck with it. And hypervisor debugging is also really painful. If you have an error, it slows down the system. There's also sometimes no and really bad errors. For example, if you have a misaligned struct or a wrong value at some field, you just get a VM exit invalid. It just doesn't tell you where, to, where the error is. It just tells you VM exit invalid. Have fun, figure it out yourself. So you have to be prepared to spend a lot of time in WinDebug. The support is really good there, also for Rust, which was really surprising, but you have to be prepared for that. And there's going to be lots of headbanging because if you have a bug in the VM exit handler, it causes the system to freeze. And so you don't want to develop it on your main system. So you need a virtual machine. And then you need to set up nested paging and also nested virtualization. And ideally, you want to automate it because, trust me, you're going to need to restart the VM a lot. And all the performance can be a problem because if you have lots of VM exits, it's bad for performance. And if you have a slow VM exit handler, it's even worse for performance. And if you combine those two, if you have lots of VM exits and a slow VM exit handler, it's terrible. And also, there's really a lack of resources. There's a few really good blog posts, but most of them, or almost all of them, were for Intel. And there's also mostly just projects on GitHub. And I created a list uh, on my GitHub, feel free to check it out. And this helped me the most. And for the doc documentation, I just recommend sticking with the Intel or MD manual because they're up to date. and yeah, have all the information you need. And also a really important tip is maybe just ask someone who already has something done something similar. Because there's a high chance they had a similar error or know someone who had a similar error, and it will save you a lot of time. And to come to the conclusion, I really enjoyed using Rust. Despite all of the problems, I still think the compiler have, has saved me from a lot of issues I would have had if I had, for example, used C++, maybe I wouldn't even have finished it. And also found a ton of useful NoSDQ crate. For example, I also implemented some function hooking, and it turns out the ICE crate also has NoSDQ support. It was really useful. I didn't want to implement my own disassembler in a yeah Windows kernel module. And yeah, as I mentioned, the bit flag and bit field crate were also really nice. And yeah, also custom allocators. They're so powerful. And also being implemented into the alloc crate saved me a ton of time. And inline and global assembly were also really cool. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions.